four days. That's a good thing. I'm, not, I'm not sorry. Good. You ain't missing anything. Good. The world is as crazy as it was before you left. Oh, it's still well, crazy. Good. <clears throat> good. Some things don't change, I guess. I saw something briefly, but it was just like a comment. Um, something about like the U.S. Like saying, yeah, let's bring Ukraine into NATO. And I was like, obviously that's been what they're angling for. But I was like, did the U.S. actually come out and say that? Well, that, by the way, would be an that. extremely bad move. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Somebody might might mind but that. Wasn't it, wasn't it um, Sweden who recently came out like in favor? They were like it. one of the whole. And they came out like in favor of it, and that was oh really a couple weeks ago. I thought they were the holdout that prevented it the last time. Okay, they were, look, you guys, was... you guys have a fairly firm grasp of geopolitics. You have a fair understanding of um, the ramifications of adding Ukraine to NATO. What's going to happen if that happens? Nothing good. We're already there's already a war, so we already have to de facto like go and defend them. It's what they'll say, but who's going to go do the fighting? Hobart, like, what happens? Don't be me. Hobart, what happens if we add Ukraine to, to NATO? Like what Jordan's talking about. Like, I'm pretty sure it's going to pull us and the rest of the allies into it, which I don't know if anybody's been paying attention for the last four years, but we fund all the allies. So it's literally just pulling us in and, and either either directly or through secondary and tertiary means. Yeah. Right. Plus, and, I mean, it's, and you, and we, and people think that Putin's pissed off now. Yeah. Like, it's what it, will definitely piss him it's off. world war three is what yeah. it is. And that's yeah. what it does is, is it formally, it formally involves all of the NATO allies in the conflict um, officially yeah. because they, I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the entire pact is, you know, they're all supposed to support one another in that. And it also on the other side, um, it validates Putin's point the entire time that that was the intent. And so then that solidifies his position when he's going out and, and securing his allies. So like you said, you know, world war, whatever the hell we want to call it. So, uh, yeah, and, it's not, and why, it's not a good and thing. why is it happening mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's because the financial system is about to collapse. So they need the war for the yeah. excuse. to and, gain and, the there's, power and there's to a presidential money. election this year. Yeah. 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 Which, and <laughs> on top of that, the the funny thing about that whole Boston Baltimore <clears throat> Boston Baltimore whatever Baltimore Bridge deal is that um, we've got a couple key naval fleet ships in that port, and from my understanding is that like demand for U.S. naval forces is only as high as it's ever been at least in the last couple of decades, hmm. and but then they... then the stuff in Taiwan goes down with the earthquake. If they like, imagine if Taiwan asked for U.S. aid. Like, where's the state? Go? Like, it's already spread. The, the the channel in Baltimore's already been opened up. Oh, has it? Okay, yeah. Good. So, like, they can get things in and out now. Oh, uh, fantastic! And I, I think that's able to stay on top of I the news. I was surprised that it was open that quick. Like, it's not like you know, there's not the there's no bridge. Obviously, that's like years down the road. But like, they're <laughs> able to get things in and out. And I was kind of surprised it happened that quick. Uh, but I mean, if there's naval vessels there, yeah, they're going to move quick to get it out. But also, I guess the quicker you move, the more easily you remove evidence of anything that could, if it was like something nefarious, which I'm starting to think it's, it's not really, I think it was yeah. just a stupid accident, but, uh, doesn't help to clean it up real quick. <laughs> okay. Brief, briefly back to the Ukraine thing. I have a quick comment on that. <clears throat> So I'm not necessarily a fan of Putin, and I don't know everything about the man. But from what I do know of him, if Ukraine is allowed into NATO, I believe that they would consider that basically a declaration of war from NATO. And uh, he's I mean, definitely put incentivized. Your, put yourself, to yeah, put yourself in Putin's shoes. You're one country. You're now at war with NATO. <laughs> yeah, and you have nuclear weapons. Yeah, it's not ideal. No, so he's, he's at he's at the very least incentivized to try and get the rest mm -hmm. of Asia mm -hmm. like on his side. Sure, I mean, there's lots of incentives for them to do that. Whether there's incentives for anyone else to join, sort of the the team Russia, 
who knows? I guess we're going to see and we'll see how that plays out. But I don't, I don't think it's great to take any nation that's, that's as nuclear capable as Russia and back them into a corner. No, I mean, no. they're, their ballistic missile technology is either on par or, I mean, very similar or maybe, I'd say it's as advanced as we have. I mean, there was a period of time before SpaceX was launching constantly that we actually were hiring Russia to put our payloads into space because they they could do it and we couldn't. Yeah, And that went on for years, which is embarrassing as fuck, but that's the reality. Yeah. So, I mean, the I let, to translate what I just said, if you can put payloads into orbit, you can fire ballistic inter intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles and hit what you're shooting at, basically. Which is the standard. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. um well, I'm not I mean, I'm not making any projections here, but I just think that that's not great. And I really hope they don't do it. Yeah. It would be like it also just shows, in my opinion, the like a good example of the incompetence and impotence of the current both administrative leadership and then I, I I'm sorry but like military leadership has been pretty pissed for for a while yep like well, we, we, sh we should not be allowing that to happen it also says something about like the bureaucratic institution and how much like you know the administrative state that Nico was talking about last show like Mm -hmm. how much that's in control of things now obviously we want it's not like we want them to be in control of things and doing things counter but it also shows how stupid and inept they are to like you do have the power and capability but you're letting it go down this road like yeah because we're just raising up terrible incompetent mm -hmm. people within government producer jordan yo are we on live on twitter yet that's a <laughs> great question <laughs> well, like the um, oh the uh, like yeah 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 live on Twitter yeah. is that a thing? Okay, good. I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are just making sure. Okay, jeez, I was like, <laughs> he's like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> the, the other producer set this all up, and I was like, look, I was just told to hit play. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, all right. For those of you new who new to the pod, <laughs> our regular <laughs> producer Shane Hazel is not yeah. here. He's making preparations for a brave mission this weekend. So kudos There's always, to where you be. There's always yeah. so many things going on in the background. Mm. Like people don't under a lot of okay, everyone that's listening and watching right now knows, but like Maybe. Anybody new that's going to turn on late? Maybe not. Maybe there's some new people. We have 70 people live on on Twitter right now. We haven't even gone live yet. Fucking weirdos. But they, a lot of people don't understand how many things are going on in the background. This is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And like, well, that also goes to just like the, like when you talk about anything regarding intelligence or like any sort of secret operations, it's like, well, like how could any, how could somebody keep a secret like that? It's like, you don't understand what's capable in a 24 hour day and then multiply that times 365 and then multiply that times 10 20 years like the amount of things that you can get done and accomplished without like other people knowing <laughs> like give me a break dude <laughs> what is it 39 we're on 39 yeah i believe so and yeah it's a pretty good start tight getting there <laughs> what's 39 weeks 52 weeks is a year gents almost there we've almost been doing this for Close. a year now I think feel we only like had it. two weeks where we didn't like Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and Christmas or something. Yep. Those periods might have that might have been all we did. Nice yeah, work, man. gents, and everybody <laughs> listening in in the background. I'll tell Appreciate you what, it. man, it's been wild to see what's happened with this thing. Who knew <sighs> what was going to happen? Right, like everybody who's part of BV, like you Bitcoin veterans, you guys, um, kudos to all you guys, man. Shout outs and love y'all because it's absolutely amazing to watch. Oh yeah, maniac. We're just we're just guys who talk. Like all these guys are the things that make this thing go. Appreciate. I'm most. Of, I'm honestly most amazed by. Like I'm not. I'm not gonna lie, guys. I'm gonna, I can't do the group chat stuff. I I figured it would like there'd be a moment where the group chats would just get like stale, and and activity would slow to like a, to a halt or something. And would 
It would be nice if it would do that every once in a while. Yeah. You, know, uh, you retards. I'm yeah. I'm okay with it because like I'd rather I I I like seeing like the fact that I have almost like three thousand missed messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D don't go to sleep on the messages, man. You come back and you'll you'll never get out. <laughs> never. Uh, I I like if I get on top of them even for fifteen minutes, I'm already behind. Like there's yeah. no way I could ever be on top. You're never gonna recover from that. <laughs> Man, and anyway, I don't want exactly. All right. yeah, there you go. Three twenty-seven in four hours. It's about that time. It's about that time. Let's see. What's do we want to take any bets if he's gonna make it in time? I don't think no. it matters. I think we just <laughs> go. All right. Let's go. That shit never gets old. You know what I was just thinking about? Is that we should have waited for him. <laughs> because it would have been cool if he saw that. Like every single per every single guest we have on here that sees that video is like, holy shit. Yeah. Well, How did you oh, do well. that? Hey, it's the best one out there. <laughs> no doubt. Coin well, father. Who, who's, who's putting him in the front leaning rest? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave that to you. Uh, you were the officer. Well, he he texted me. Yeah, he exactly. Said, hey. I, I have an NCO for that. <laughs> he said, "I'm driving home now. My ETA is seven. So, so what? What a week! I huh? think I think it's fair game to to give him a little bit of a ration of shit for being late. Yeah, First late him, guest. Yeah, of course. Teach man. him the the way. Man, <laughs> who is this guy again? Uh, <laughs> feed feed love. Was that it? Uh, he's, hey. only, he's, only, he's only one of the most um, probably well-known podcasters in all of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Oh, my God. There he is. Who oh, is well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Ryan? One of the best writers. What's up, fellas? How are you doing? Just, How's just it going? The best intro in the game. You missed the best part of the pod. Oh, Not really the best part. Good. Actually, the best part is going to be the conversation with you, but you missed the intro. In fact, it's so good. I think you should play it again so he can see it. Uh, I'm I totally not any kidding. Objections. I never get tired of it. No. Let's go. And there you have it. There well, it is. Pretty about us. Right. Robert Breelove. Good evening and welcome to Bitcoin Veterans. So you in a, a movie theater or something. That was cool. <laughs> oh, that wait. was made by Shane Hazel, former Force Recon Marine door kicker. Nice work, Shane. Man's yeah. got skills. Man's He's a man of skills. many talents, so that's oh, for yeah. sure. So how All right. Like Go ahead, man. Yeah. Well, let me do the intro. Since Shane's not here, I'll, I'll step in and be the host tonight. So welcome to Bitcoin Veterans. We are Bitcoiners. We are also veterans. We are on a mission to help veterans understand what Bitcoin is all about, why it can serve uh, a way of finding your purpose in life, why it's a way of basically filling in the gaps of what we thought we were doing when we joined the military. For many of us who joined, we were basically sheepdogs out there with a the nature to protect other people. Bitcoin is an amazing way to actually do that. That may be hard to understand if you're just hearing about it, but stick around. You'll find out why. Because basically the fiat money monetary system is utterly broken. And we think that Bitcoin is a way 
to fix and repair it. We're going to be talking with Robert Breedlove tonight, who's done a lot of work in this area. And uh, very excited to have this conversation with him. Uh, so let me give a little intro to Robert. Robert is a freedom maxi. So am I, by the way. He's an ex-hedge fund manager, philosopher in the Bitcoin space. To him, Bitcoin is fundamentally a humanitarian movement exposing the greatest con in human history, which is central banking. By learning about the connection between honest money, entrepreneurship, and civilization, we are renewing hope for the future of humanity. To this end, Robert's mission is to restore freedom, truth, and virtue in our world by tenaciously asking the question, what is money? And he has a podcast named What Is Money? You can find it on YouTube. My man, all of those things that I just said aligns um, pretty perfectly with the mission of Bitcoin veterans, basically. Yeah, I think so. That's a, it's actually kind of a, that's a bio I wrote, I think when we started the show and it's a little bit fluffy, but I was trying to write something that encap encapsulated everything about Bitcoin. Um, a more prosaic way I've been saying it recently is like money is a game. If you don't understand how that game is being played, then you are the game being played basically. Yeah. So um, it's a worthwhile pursuit to study the nature of money no matter what like it, and it also gets me beyond prescribing bitcoin to anyone because i don't actually want to do that i don't think i don't like the word should very much i think it should rarely be used <laughs> and so i don't like to tell people that they should buy bitcoin but i do say you should study bitcoin and obviously the natural first pathway you go down when you study bitcoin is the nature of money because the answer to what is Bitcoin is money. And then you say, well, what is money? And that's a whole rabbit hole unlock. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I've been, I hope I'm glad that a lot of people have gotten value out of the show and um, it is extremely nerdy. I'm, I'm surprised that as many people are into it as there are because it, we're extremely nerdy, right? It's extremely dense at times. Uh, quite esoteric, but I think people people seem to have a hunger, right? People don't want sound bites, and they don't want bullshit. They don't want distilled mainstream media narratives. I think people, especially people, you know, open mindedly exploring the internet, people that tend to be self taught or autodidactic, they want to know the truth about things. And um, Bitcoin, man, it is uh, definitely a gateway to a whole lot of truth, a whole lot of matrix unplug. So I'm thrilled to be a part of that. And um, yeah, I we, it's nerdy and all of that, but we also try to keep it down to earth, we try to use a lot of metaphors and analogies and make it accessible. So hopefully that's good uh, We're achieving for, that. for our audience analogies and uh Keeping it simple is, is metaphors, great. similes. <laughs> they're all very useful for us. I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally joking. Some of these guys, some of these guys who are veterans are incredibly smart pilots, engineers, so on and so forth. The officers tend to be pretty smart sometimes. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not smart or dumb, in my opinion. You, we need to be mindful that we are coming out of the economic dark ages, basically. What does that mean? Actually, okay, let's do this. Before we dark dive into this, sounds pretty deep. The the economic dark ages. I want to I want to extrapolate on that. But before we go there, Robert, today, prior to the pod, we hung out for a little while. We went down to um, a undisclosed location, live fire range. We spent the afternoon uh, getting in some reps, doing some pew pews. What were your impressions? What do you think? I had an amazing time. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of the last time I shot before that. I lived in Vegas for a while. We used to shoot pretty often. I moved to Los Angeles. We didn't shoot as often. Um, Not surprising. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously a little more difficult there. <laughs> um, I've been out shooting a couple of times the past couple of years, but that was the first time in a while, probably in about a year. And now that I'm settled here, uh, just moved into this house a couple of months ago. 
Uh, I would like to th make that a regular occurrence. I think it's what is it? It is um, training, right? Uh, one of my favorite quotes is Musashi: "The way is in training." So this is what I love. This is why the same reason I like to read hard books and train physically difficult, right? Physically arduous workouts. I want to learn new technique um, and really have a, a good under, as you were saying, Alex, you're like, instead of trying to understand how to use a bunch of different guns, it's like, you need to pick one or two and just know these things cold forwards and backwards. And so that whole, and everyone had a good time, right? We we're with um, my product production guy and a couple of friends and everyone has a blast and it's something productive and it's something that, I guess it feels like you are claiming your sovereignty to some extent, right? You're creating a little more symmetry between you and anyone that might do you harm, whether that be a uh, illicit criminal or a licit criminal. So it was it was a great time, and I think I'm going to make it a regular occurrence now that I'm down here. Fantastic. Glad you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun too. Um, I do love getting out there and, uh, I call it, um, getting lots of reps in with good friends. So yes. we will definitely do it again. Okay. So let's get into some, uh, Bitcoin or Bitcoin -y economics. What is money type things? You said something about, we are coming out of the economic dark ages. Uh, let's go expand on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing you guys probably haven't heard before, and uh, don't mean it to sound overly <laughs> uh, embellished. But, you know, I always try to remind myself that it was only the mid-1800s, so we're talking not even 200 years ago. So if the average person lives 70 years, right, it's three people ago, not that long ago in the scope of human history, that there was an actual debate on whether value was an objective property of the universe, right? They thought there was a thesis that value was made up of utils, like the elementary particle of value. And so, you know, a bottle of water had, for example, 30 utils, and maybe a pen had 15 utils. And this explained why their price relationship was two to one on the free market, right? The bottle would be twice as expensive as the pen. That was people actually thought that was true, right? It was a big point of uh, intellectual contention. And then we had the, the mid 1800s, um, the marginalism revolution, what, what people call the marginal theory of value, where it turns out all value is subjective, right? It's a matter of preference. A bottle of water has, you know, someone's going to prefer a bottle of water in certain circumstances and not in others, right? Like if you're in the desert, you would probably have a higher preference for water than you would if you were drowning for instance there's nothing intrinsic or objectively valuable about a bottle of water even as something as life as essential to life as water itself so it sounds like somewhat obvious now like oh value is a matter of preference it's purely subjective but that was a revolution in economics three people ago so yeah. the, the the idea that we are just now coming to terms with the actual nature of money and how much damage we have done by corrupting money, you know, specifically through the centralization and monopolization of currency under the paradigm of central banking. That's not surprising to me in the least. Um, if we're talking about, you know, Bitcoin is like the first, uh, one way to define Bitcoin would be the first asset or the first money that is 100% monetary premium. Whereas everything prior to Bitcoin was an approximation of money at best. So if that is an accurate statement, which it is an accurate statement that Bitcoin is 100% monetary premium. There's nothing else that's 100% monetary premium. Um, then you could argue that... Well, let me, way, let me stop you for a second there. Yeah. Are dollars not 100% monetary premium? You know, I was, I was thinking that as I said it, actually... Um, so tech, and this is where people get into the the jargon about. Well, it, they would say, "Oh, so Bitcoin is fiat then, because fiat currency technically is one hundred percent monetary premium." The problem with that is, I look at fiat currency as though it has an 
innate liability. Yeah. Another way to, and if it's not a liability, if you don't want to, if you don't like that terminology, you could say it's there's counterparty risk built into the dollar. So right. even if you take all your dollars out of your bank account and stuff them under your mattress, which is what a lot of doom preppers think is the right thing to do, you have not protected yourself from the counterparty risk of the Federal Reserve printing more dollar bills or electronically producing more dollar bills to be more accurate mm -hmm. and siphoning the purchasing power out of the dollars that you stuffed under your mattress. Yeah. So whereas you might argue that there's no industrial use value for a physical dollar, which I would agree, like the paper has very limited industrial use. So most of the value is monetary premium. There's also this liability or counterparty risk component that you cannot get rid of, right? It, it, mm -hmm. this is, and this is essential to understanding money is like, the dollar was born as a debt instrument, right? It was a debt certificate for gold or for monetary metals. That was its purpose, was to make monetary metals more transactable, basically. Easier to carry, easier to store, easier to move, um, just by abstracting gold and monetary metals into this paper and later electronic representation, we gained a lot of economic advantages in terms of transaction efficiency. But we also picked up a lot of problems, namely counterparty risk. Yeah. And um, so that would be my argument there. It's not 100% monetary premium because there's a liability <clears throat> component. So if you think about the equation in accounting, assets equals liabilities plus equity. So if you own an asset with no encumbrance on it or no debt on it, right? You own your house, for instance, and you don't have a mortgage. Well, then assets, house worth a million dollars equals liabilities plus equity. You have zero dollars in liabilities on that house. You have a million dollars equity in your house, right? So A, one million equals L plus E, zero plus one million equation wow. balance. Now, when you add... Um, now, if you have a mortgage, well, you have a million dollar mortgage, right? You have a million dollar house. It has a half million dollar mortgage on it. That's a debt that you, you owe. You owe the bank that much money for your house. Well, then you have half a million dollars in equity, right? So if you look at money in those terms, I would say that you could never have a dollar that would be a pure asset, right? Or pure monetary premium because it always has that liability component that there's some percentage of it that it is exposed to the counterparty risk of the central bank. Whereas if you own gold, you own physical gold, right? Your possession, that's what we call a bearer asset. You again have that pure ownership. Uh, you have, there's no liability attached to the physical possession of gold because the physical possessor is presumed to be the rightful owner. Well, same is true with Bitcoin, right? Um, you have a pure asset. That if you hold it in self custody, obviously, if you have Bitcoin on an exchange, then you have, you don't have that. You have 100% liability, actually, right? You have a claim on Bitcoin, but it's an IOU. That exchange or that bank owes you that Bitcoin. You don't have anything, actually. You have a promise. So, as a money that is, that can be, you know, has 100% monetary premium and that has no other industrial use and it simultaneously uh, can be held in a way that it's a pure bearer asset. Like we don't, we have nothing like that prior to Bitcoin. The closest thing would be physical gold, but physical gold also has industrial use, as you said. So, you know, the market cap of gold is whatever, $14 trillion. 80% of that is demand for gold as money. 20% of that more or less, is demand for gold as uh, industrial metal, right? Computers, dent dentistry, et cetera. So that's an impure money. It's an, it's an approximation of money. So if you put all these things together, I think it could be argued that Bitcoin is the invention of money. Like we've had approximations of money throughout history mm. until 2009. And um, thanks to Satoshi for inventing uh, the first pure money, if not money itself. So that's a really awesome point. And it's, it's, there's, there's something that I've been going over again and again in my mind. And, is, and that is, you know, what, what it really takes for someone who is, who has no interest in learning about Bitcoin, no interest in, you know, and they, they, they want to stick with their, 
their perception of of the world um and it just i mean it it makes perfect sense now because if there is no true point of reference for what real money actually is then how can they know it how will they recognize it when they see it um i mean and, and i guess on that note what what do you see is um you know is the biggest hurdle for people when when having conversations with them and i know that your you know your reach is is vast at, at this point but i mean throughout you know throughout the multiple conversations that you've had with people i mean what is it really that that in your experience um brings them to that place where they're prepared to accept um the conversation and to begin to study bitcoin on their own well, that's a great question, and clearly, it's a general question, right? We're asking mm -hmm. what what brings people to Bitcoin, and that question has a million. Has, there are many. There are as many different answers to that question as there are people coming to Bitcoin. But if I have to generalize about it, somewhat, um, there's sort of two paths, really, and. Um, I think the first path is much better than the second path, but I think people take the second path much more often. Uh, the first path is proof of work, right? You can actually do the work to intellectually study Bitcoin. You can study the work of those who have spent time studying Bitcoin. You can then go into the different rabbit holes it leads you into like we already mentioned money once you get into the question what is money typically defined as the universal medium of exchange that has three functions right unit of account medium of exchange store of value you have to go into all those domains well what is value what is accounting what does it mean to exchange um you get into the the technological aspects of money well is it a technology it's like sort of there's a physical instantiation for money, historically at least. That's what metals were. But it's also this, you know, if I'm using a John Verveke term, he calls them psychotechnologies, like the English language. Um, you know, it's, it's not physically instantiated, yet we use it, right? It's like a software that humans use to interconnect their minds. Money has some qualities like that, right? We all think in terms of dollars. We negotiate prices in terms of dollars. We plan our businesses and our personal affairs in terms of dollars, et cetera. So there's that very arduous, uh, heavy, intellectually heavy path. Um, and it's that's also especially for the people that went down that path early, you also have to be very disagreeable, I think. And this is common among a lot of Bitcoiners. I think they, they are mostly trait disagreeable mm -hmm. because you have to be willing to stand against the crowd and say, no, you're all wrong. Like the reasoning is correct and the consensus is wrong, basically. Um, and that, that obviously that changes over time, right? Like you know, we have people say there's 100 million people holding Bitcoin worldwide, which is still a significant minority, but that's a huge amount of people compared to, you know, seven, eight, 10 years ago. Um, so there's that path and that path, you know, online, you hear people throwing around this number 100 hours. It's like you need to listen to 100 hours of podcasts or read 100 hours about Bitcoin or money or slash, 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 right? You need to do 100 hours of cognitive labor to get that light bulb moment. And that light bulb moment is different for everyone. Um, it, it's at a different intensity for everyone, right? For some people, it's a gradual process. Like the light bulb gradually comes on. Sometimes people actually have the binary. Oh, someone, you know, Jeff Booth said one sentence and all of a sudden it clicked with me. Um, so there's that whole path. The problem with that whole path is I think a lot of people that are caught up in the fiat paradigm or the fiat rat race, to, to put it more bluntly, they don't have a lot of time, right? I, or, I don't actually like to say that because when, when you say I don't have time or what you're really saying is it's not a priority for me. A lot of people prioritize chasing dollars and, you know, consuming the bread and circuses that Caesar puts out for them, right? This is all part of the the fiat charade, if you will. And there's a lot of 
sheeple, right? We call them sheeple, people that are caught up in this rat race. So to get someone interested in a 100 hour enterprise of cognitive labor, promising yeah. that they're going to see the light and join the cult and, you know, all this is like people are like, if you take, if you really take a step back, if you pull yourself out of Bitcoin for a minute and someone approaches you with this, you're like, yeah, fucking right. Like I'm not, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, no, yeah. You and your friends online did not discover the meaning of all the problems in the world and Bitcoin doesn't fix everything. Like it's just, it actually sounds crazy from a distance. Right. So it's difficult to convince people to go down one path one. So that's my point there. Path two, I think, is going to be the more common motivator for people to adopt Bitcoin. And that is pain, right? Pain. You have to experience the problems firsthand in your life that Bitcoin solves. And in that very visceral experience of not enjoying the situation, whether it is your bank account has been frozen, um, you are being subjected to capital controls, you are trying to survive in a in, you know rapidly inflating environment or a ha even a hyperinflationary environment, or maybe you're a billionaire in a certain country that's uh, enacting certain wealth redistribution schemes, right? Or they're, they're doing bail-ins, bail-outs, all of these fiat regulations, manipulations of the monetary system, even at the geopolitical scale, right? I think Russia had $600 billion of their foreign reserves frozen. Okay, you don't think that's going to make them scratch their head and think about what their alternatives are in terms of holding something that cannot be frozen in the future? Yeah. That it's was like, a wake up call to a <clears throat> lot of countries. Yeah. So this like on this second road, the mantra we current we often refrain on the show, and this is something I got from Taleb, is that pain is in formation, right? Pain is that which puts you into a new formation. It's literally when you touch the hot stove, most of us will be told not to touch the hot stove. <laughs> And I, I don't know, maybe one in 10 or one in a hundred actually don't ever touch it to figure it out. But most people, I don't know the number, the proportion end up touching that damn stove before they learn not to do it again. So as much as we proselytize and evangelize Bitcoin, there's a paradox here because I think it's actually going to be the state that ends up orange pilling vastly more people than any of us ever could hope to, right? Like a thousand to one, if not more, because yep. the state is the, inf the primary inflictor of that pain, right? They are the ones. And I, under the, the rubric of the state, I'm saying the centralized fiat state that's enabled by the central bank, right? So they're the ones hyperinflating the currency. They're the ones waging wars. They're the ones imposing capital controls. They're the ones uh, implementing social credit score systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? They are the inflictor of the pain. Therefore, they are going to be the primary motivator for people to figure out how to solve these problems that they are creating. And as we, um, I don't want to say we know, but as we think or as we theorize or as we, as we reason, Bitcoin is the solution to many of those problems. And so I think pain will ultimately be what moves most people into Bitcoin. But I, you know, I want to say this too, that is not the, you don't have to take that path, right? It is much more cost effective to learn from the mistakes of others than it is to learn from your own. And this is why it's so important to be a student, I think, right? Open, if you think the U S dollar is not going to hyperinflate, right? You're basing that on your own limited 30, 40, 50 year old lifespan because you the dollar has been around the whole time. And so you have this presupposition that it's not going anywhere. Open a history book about fiat currencies. Any history book about fiat currencies. And just go to town. It did, like, just pick one. Go any, any fiat currency anywhere, anytime, anytime, place. Tell me how it ended. <laughs> so it's it's like, always, you don't, you don't always the same. The pain. You can learn from the mistakes of others. So mm -hmm. I have to call to action to like be a student. Well, not to mention like doing that, like it gives you a good grasp on how like how those failures of those different currencies lead to particularly impactful world events that cause other forms of pain <clears throat> pain and ramifications for not just like the populations directly involved but populations secondarily and tertiarily related 
to mm-hmm. like that particular system. Everyone gets hurt by it. You know, there's no, the problem is this is when you collapse the currency, you're collapsing the lifeblood that interconnects the economic organism, right? And when that collapses, well, the division of labor collapses, the output of goods and services collapses, real wealth collapses. So it doesn't matter. You can be the richest person on earth. You're still going to get hurt in that event. Even you could be, I mean, you could take this example, like hypothetical example to the absolute extreme and say, um, you're holding most of the physical gold in the world when the currencies, you know, there's a global hyperinflation. You're holding the most gold in the world. There's a global hyperinflation. Real purchasing power, like real goods and services still decline. So the purchasing power of your money still declines. So it's in no one's interest ever to destroy the currency, but it is in, and it's in no one's long run interest. Let's say that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but there is a short run interest to print the money, right? Whoever can print the money and get close to it can benefit themselves today. The parasite can eat today, but if the parasite eats too much, then it kills the host. And when the host yeah. dies, all the parasites die too. You know, in your in your example, if you have a collapse of currency, even if you have all the gold in the world, I would argue that that doesn't matter anyway. Because if you have a collapse of the currency, we're back to basics. People are worried about where do I get my water? Yeah. Where do I get my food? My electricity might be shutting off. What, hap- what happens to refrigeration? What happens to the refrigeration of, of medicines that, that a good percentage of the population depends upon, mm-hmm. um, how much food is left, all the things, right? And I would argue that most people, you could say, okay, well, you know, I have all these bars of gold. Can I give them to you for like whatever? And if people are like, man, I just need water and food. Yeah. They aren't going to give any craps about your gold. It's absolutely true. Yeah, the, the the purchasing power of gold is proportionate to the amount of goods and capital we've built up in the real world. So if that capital, that supply of goods and capital starts to draw down, well, then the purchasing power of gold goes down with it. And in times of acute crisis, as you're describing, ammunition is currency. Food is currency. Water is currency. Yeah, man. So. Good stuff. The other way, the other way to think about it too, because um, Robert, I had listened to, I just listened to like your most recent discussion with uh, Andy and Jesse, <clears throat> and you had you had brought up something that I think you and I had talked about that I think it helps really get the value of like having a, a genuine money like Bitcoin as far as like the blood and uh, the blood like the blood and oxygen for an economy similar to like a body is that like you compare an economy to an ecosystem, right? That's, I mean, that's basically what an economy is, is an ecosystem or it's an ecosystem of ecosystems even. Mm -hmm. And we, you and I had talked about complex adaptive systems in the sense of, I think we talked about like probably like the lionfish or something like that, where people need to understand that if a currency gets hyperinflated away in the same way of like a food source for a particular creature in an ecosystem, the, uh, the balance of that entire system gets completely thrown out of whack. And then like, it can get so bad as like it, the, the population of one predator runs all the way up, causes the co- collapse of another species. And then the entire ecosystem has to completely reset for anything to actually continue growing into the future. Yes. No, it's, but, yeah. I want to, I want to reel it in for a minute because we're, we're talking <laughs> about at this point, extreme tail risks. Right? Yeah. Most people who are going to listen to this are going to go, unless they're prior military, are going to go, that kind of stuff's probably never going to happen, which is probably true. So let's talk about this in more practical terms. Um, What's highly likely to happen in your view? And then after that, I want to switch gears completely and maybe talk a little bit about forever wars, the military industrial complex, stuff like that. But before we get to that, What's what's realistic in your view next you, 10 years? You just laid out the most dangerous course of action. Now now lay out the most probable course of action. Well, let me first say that. Uh, <laughs> just predict the future for us live on air. <laughs> no pressure, bro. Those who live by the crystal ball are bound to eat glass. So, Ooh, I, I, Ooh. never heard that. That's good. Really? Oh, well, I mean. 
just to, I mean, this applies to any human, right? Mm-hmm. If they're going to tell you something about the future, it's like, well, take it with a grain of salt. Obviously, none of us have a crystal ball. So I'm not saying any of, the, although I may sound emphatic when I say it, I'm not saying it with like, this is going to happen. Of course, that would be ridiculous. Um, okay, look, in general, I don't know. Where are we at? We're kind of in this. Whew, man, it's crazy to talk about. So there's a lot of things happening, right? We're going through the transition of an age, first of all. So again, this is what I think. I don't know if you can prove it or not. I don't really know if you'll know that it actually happened until retrospect. You know, we when we were transitioning from, let's say, the agricultural age into the industrial age you know i don't think that people living during that time had this bright line you know if you're like in year one of the industrial age you're not like oh thank god we're out of the agricultural age and we're in the industrial age now like Whoa, yes that farming shit was getting old now we can go work <laughs> in factories and build cities and plane like you don't know that it's happening while it's happening right however i think it we could make a pretty strong argument that we are well into the early days of the digital age, right? The, 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 we've had a disruption in the media paradigm, for instance, right? There used to be kind of these few to many broadcasting model, right? There's a few centralized broadcasting, both television networks, radio networks, uh, newspaper distribution networks that distributed to many people. Uh, that was much more centralized, much more easy to control the narrative, for instance. Well, in digital media paradigm, as we are enacting right now, we have this many to many media model, right? Where people can just log in from different places in the world and have open dialogue about whatever. And the bandwidth is effectively free. And then when you publish this, it lasts basically forever on the internet. So that is one indication, you know, um, media technologies are a good indicator when, when the transition of an age is coming, right? You could also look at what the printing press did to the medieval church, right? That was a good example that books were very expensive luxury item. And then all of a sudden they become very cheap. People develop literacy and numeracy a lot more easily because books are more plentiful. And then all of a sudden people are, you know, engaging in critical thinking. And then the medieval church stops being the dominant institution in the land, uh, you know, scientific revolution, enlightenment, etc. Um, the way information flows tends to be a good indicator that big changes are coming, right? Yeah. And I would say the one defining feature of the digital age so far is that the liquidity of information has never been higher, right? The speed at which we are generating data and moving information around the world <clears throat> It's just never been higher, right? There's plenty of charts supporting this. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was something like we created more data in the past three years than like the past, the rest of human history before that, something like that, right? On, online. And it keeps, it's accelerating, right? Moore's Law is accelerating everything. Uh, the acceleration begets more acceleration. So it's exponential. So if we were to try... So if we assume, let's just assume that we are in the transition of an age and we're moving from the industrial age into the digital age. Well, now, by way of analogy, imagine trying to speak with someone at the end of the agricultural age about all of the miracles or products of the industrial age, right? This is a guy who lives on a farm. He's probably got animal-powered farming equipment, a pitchfork, you know, wooden housing, you know, whatever you would assume, I guess, for kind of a basic agrarian. And you're like, yeah, you know, we're going into this industrial age now. We're going to build giant cities with really tall skyscrapers made out of steel and glass. And we're going to have cars that are made of metal and we'll build airplanes that fly through the sky made out of aluminum. And we'll have wires that you know, fiber optic cables that connect the world to, to communicate and we'll have telephones and telegraph. Like, none of those words that I just said, <laughs> like not 95% of those words wouldn't even make sense to the guy. He's like, I don't know anything that you just said. So 
it, it is, we forget this, right? We think lad, language is like this static structure that we all just download English and we got it and that's it. It's like, that's not true at all. Language changes all the time and it changes largely as our technological realities change. Um, and so where we're going, like, that would be almost my optimistic view. It's like, we can't even begin to imagine what this world looks like, what we're moving into and towards. Um, that may sound scary too. It's like, oh, what do you mean? But I mean, I would argue that although there are many trade-offs here, obviously moving from the agricultural age into the industrial age, I think most people would agree that was a net benefit for humanity, right? We increase the population a lot. We increase goods per capita a lot. We've created things like, you know, medicines, antibiotics, refrigerators. Like we have so many luxuries that we enjoy. Our standard of living has gone up so high. We've increased food output per capita, and we've done all this while exploding the world population, right? If you look at GDP per capita over all of human history, it's like a flat line, and then you hit the Industrial Revolution, and it goes completely vertical. So, okay, did that come with a lot of problems? Of course. We've had, you know, I, I won't even go into it. There's a million problems in modernity, but if you're just looking at, at wealth per capita as like a proxy for how good are we at solving human problems, which is basically what that is, right? Wealth is a solution to a problem, right? That's what people, no matter what business you're in, you're selling a solution to a problem. Well, the number of solutions per person went through the roof in the industrial age. So, and a lot of that was driven by tapping into more energy, right? We tapped into fossil fuels and then we were able to move our ideas around the world much more quickly. So that when there's one successful innovation in one place in the world, well, then it spreads like wildfire. We all benefit we all liberate more time and then we can start focusing our time and energy on even more uh, pernicious problems, right? Solving even higher value problems and so on and so forth. So in the digital age, well, the internet's been a big deal. That's very exciting so far. Uh, now we have the internet of money, all right? And so Bitcoin, let's already say that we're going to get those benefits that the industrial age gave us in terms of information and communication, but we're getting that again, exponentially larger with the internet. Uh, in terms of in the industrial age, you know, we, we started tapping fossil fuels. I think in the digital age, one of these aspects of Bitcoin is that it is this global bounty program that incentivizes everyone everywhere forever to monetize cheaper and stranded energy assets, right? It, it is this we don't, we've never had that. <laughs> we've never had this. It's always been economically advantageous to find cheaper energy, but it's often been difficult to export that energy, especially when it's stranded, right? So there's a case in, I think it was in Iceland or Greenland where they were using the thermal energy that was very cheap, but it wasn't connected to a grid. They would use that to smelt aluminum bauxite and then they would export the aluminum. So that was like a, a you know, a pseudo Bitcoin mining operations. Like they can't get the energy that's really cheap into the global marketplace unless they use it in some industrial process. But with Bitcoin, right, you would just drop the Bitcoin miner on any of these energy resources. And so this should continually drive the cost of energy per unit lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And if, if energy is the primary input into every economic process, which it is, cheaper energy is almost equivalent to increased wealth per capita. So you've got digital age, mass communication, paradigm shift, information moves much faster, easier, has more permanence, is cheaper. Uh, I think this facilitates more of a free market truth discovery process, right? You, you know, and we're seeing a lot of the stresses of that, right? Like mainstream media, is collapsing in credibility. People are stop, you know, the Wall Street Journal is losing its audience while X is exploding. Like you see this migration away from legacy media to digital media. Um, so, and you combine that with what I think Bitcoin will do to the energy markets, just making it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And then the other really wonderful thing about Bitcoin is that it gives people access to a medium to store their purchasing power in that cannot be confiscated if custodied properly. So 
it's a literal instantiation of that ideal power to the people, right? You actually give purchasing power to the people that own it. And then if they don't like the way they're being treated in their local jurisdiction, well, then all of a sudden, we've always heard vote with your feet, right? Oh, if you don't like America, then go elsewhere. It's like, well, okay, that's sort of useful if you're, you know, if you're a productive person, if you're a healthy taxpayer, if you've got a lot of assets, we won't talk about the exit tax, which if your net worth is above $2 million, well, Uncle Sam's going to take a chunk of that before you leave. Bitcoin changes the the negotiating leverage in that that relationship because now people can actually vote with their feet in a way that's much a uh, higher signal, let's say. They can leave with their purchasing power in a way that's uh, uninterruptible or unstoppable and unseizable. So they can go to those jurisdictions that they are treated best in. And so when and when you combine these things, and then I guess the other piece was obviously Bitcoin, as more people move their purchasing power into that medium that can't be confiscated, inflated, or stopped, then you're reducing inflation as a revenue option for the state. So no longer can the state get away with just printing money to fund whatever they want. The example I love to cite here is the war on terror, the quote unquote war on terror in the United States, which is a, a marketing euphemism, right? I don't think it was a war on terror. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, our latest imperialistic campaign as the, the global global hegemon. Between 2001 and when I looked at these numbers, initially, I think it was between 2001 and 2019. So roughly 18 years, we spent $2.5 trillion on the war on terror. And in that same time, we printed $2.8 trillion. Like, I mean, just, you know, 0 0.3 trillion more than the cost of the war on terror. So we literally printed Weird. all of the money to pay for the war on terror. And if you took that number, that $2.5 trillion, and divided it by the number of U.S. households, I think it came out to like $80,000 per U.S. household. So if, if the state did not have recourse to the money printer to just print the money to pay for that war and you know milk everyone's purchasing power over time and then have all this plausible deniability right when the inflation hits you have biden on a commercial like Ugh, these greedy capitalists need to lower their prices because i really like ice cream it's like what, what <laughs> let's talk about the, the currency even counterfeiting bro it's not the ice cream maker um if this if the state the u.s didn't have that they would have been forced to send eighty thousand dollars invoices to every American household and say, hey, you know, we're blowing some people up on the other side of the world and you need to do your part by paying this bill. You could imagine the level of resistance that would come if people received that bill directly and explicitly mm -hmm. versus this surreptitious mode of war financing we have in inflation. Yeah. So, and, that, and that's why they do it. Energy gets cheaper. People get to vote with their feet in a way that really matters. Like all of a sudden... If I vote with my feet, all my purchasing power goes with me. You don't get to exit tax me. Um, maybe as a state, all of these things and the money printer is going away as a revenue option. So you have to tax me directly and explicitly if you want to do anything. I think the combination of these factors forces states, and this is you know the sovereign individual thesis, right? Forces states to be more accountable to the preferences of their citizens. So this would be the the very beautiful, optimistic view is like, well, the state as, and again, I'm talking about the centralized, central bank enabled, fiat funded nation state. This doesn't mean your local governance structure, right? I think we'll still have local governance. If anything, we would say Bitcoin makes government local again. Right, Ooh. local government's okay. It's much more consensual. You're much more able to participate in the political process in a way that matters. People tend to be a little bit nicer to people that they interact with face to face on a you know day to day or month to month basis, rather than when you have centralized statism. You're just a row on a spreadsheet, right? When the guy in D.C. is making an option to tax you, dude, in California, he's never seen you, met you, doesn't care you. There's no empathy there. You're literally just a line on a spreadsheet. And so that would be my optimistic view, is that Bitcoin is basically defunding centralized statism, making government local again, 
defunding the war machine um, and therefore hopefully making the general patterns of human action much more peaceful, cooperative, and trade-focused. And um, all that goes back to Bastiat's old quote, right? If, if goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. So yeah. uh, Bitcoin shifts us toward more trade and less war. Absolutely. It's also I, I wanted to wanted to add to that list. You, you had ran out of fingers, um, Robert. There's also <laughs> there's also one other thing that was like it's kind of in between multiple is that the unseizability and uncensorability will feed into the increase in competition and ideas that get funded. Yes. Right. So like it, it, it speeds up the truth finding machine. It, it, which which is like it's almost like a, a dual action perpetual motion machine yeah yeah a lot of um wall street people would call that the return of value investing right like right now the money just keeps getting printed and you'd have nowhere you don't you just bet on everything right good idea bad idea doesn't matter and so a lot of capital gets misallocated yeah. but when savings holds its purchasing power over time or even grows over time Right. That's that's an indication that people are deploying capital intelligently and that they're increasing the output of goods per capita. That's why the purchasing power is growing. Again, the purchasing power of your money, hard money, would grow in tandem with the expansion of goods in the marketplace. The so entire if, marketplace. Yeah. So if you're going to invest, and I guess I should let's, let me give some definitions here. When we say the word savings. I bet most people, when they hear that word, they think money in the bank, right? Or money held. It doesn't have to be in the bank. It could be under your mattress. It could be wherever. That's what people tend to think of savings as. But the economic definition of savings is goods that have been produced but not yet consumed. So when you go to work and you produce a good or a service, you get paid in money, right? Now, if you hold that money and you don't spend it, that's, you know, the traditional uh, interpretation of savings. What that is in the real economy is you have gone into the market and produced something for other people, but you have not had you have not consumed any production in return. Right. So you've added to the global stock of goods and services, but you haven't subtracted from it yet. That is what savings actually is. Money is just a representation of that. So. Value, you know, the idea of value investing is that if the return to purchasing power on your savings, say your savings, you know, and gold used to go up, you know, what, two, three percent a year, right? The supply of gold would grow at about two percent a year, and then the purchasing power of gold would tend to go up two or three percent a year. So, and that was again, that's an, a signal that people are deploying capital effectively in the marketplace to increase goods per capita, which is reflected by the increased purchasing power of your money. Now you would only part with your money and deploy that into a project. If you thought it was going to return more than your expected purchasing power growth. If I think my purchasing power is going to grow 3%, I'm not going to invest it in a project as it's expected to turn 1%, but I will invest in a project that's expected to return 10%, right? Obviously accounting for the risk associated with any economic venture counterparty risk, operational risk, execution risk, et cetera, et cetera. So in that world with sound money, there is an actual like hurdle rate that you have to have a good idea that's better than all the other good ideas that are already being done to return purchasing power to the savers of hard money. You need, you have to, it, 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 it amp, to your point, amplifies the competitive pressure on ideas in the marketplace that only the best ideas actually win. Whereas in fiat world, <laughs> there is no, there's a negative return on money, holding money. So you literally just have to spray and pray. And this is the traditional venture capitalist approach, right? Fucking buy a hundred of these shitty startups. 90 of them will fail. Nine hopefully will break even and one will be Facebook. So, you know, it's this, you get this massive misallocation of capital and this lottery ticket style investing model and that's all a consequence of fiat currency yeah so yep. i think yeah bitcoin and sound money in general will make us more intelligent investors again that are focused on value and focus on uh solving problems in an intelligent and profitable way in the world right on okay a couple of quick observations then we're going to do some housekeeping make a couple of announcements and we're going to switch gears here 
Um, observations. Number one, for those of you who are veterans, et cetera, veteran adjacent, military, active mil military, um, like you're trying to figure out like what is the whole deal with this whole Bitcoin veterans thing? This was it. Like if you are able to have cheaper and more abundant energy, basically it's more prosperity. That's hope for the future. That's why we're here. Um, <laughs> essentially, if we're all transferring our capital into Bitcoin, we're uh, effectively defunding federal level theft. And then lastly, um, if it's unconfiscatable, and what that d does is it changes the whole system to a by permission only kind of a thing, which as Robert mentioned, that essentially demonetizes a whole bunch of things that are currently incentivized in the fiat monetary system, right? So this is how we fix a lot of the problems that a lot of us have come across and run into. I'm going to leave it at that, hit a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to dive into switch gears a little bit here. So as far as housekeeping stuff, next week, bit blog boom. Hope you're going. We have amazing discounts. Check us out at Bitcoin Veterans on Twitter if you want to get a hold of that discount. If you're a veteran, active duty, military adjacent, veteran adjacent, first responder, any of the above, um, connect with us. We're happy to hook you up. We've also got amazing discounts upcoming in Nashville. Um, also, by the way, we're going to be doing a range day in Nashville on the 25th. So hope to see you there for that. Connect with us for that. We'll be doing a Bitcoin Veterans Meetup on I think the 26th, the evening of the 26th. So hope to see you for there for that. And we will have a Bitcoin veteran Citadel. We're going to be having a, a breakout session, contingency work groups, planning, uh, ham radio certification. We're going to be talking about Citadel networks, resiliency, start nine, uh, breakout sessions, all kinds of technology breakout sessions, how to, how to self surveil yourself on chain, that type of stuff. It's going to be fantastic. And then finally, again, massive discounts to Pacific Bitcoin. Get a hold of us for any of those things. Cool. Uh, switching gears. Let's dig deeper into, I guess it's not switching gears totally, but it's in the same vein, but I want to unpack this further. This idea of Bitcoin's unconfiscatable, therefore it basically flips taxation upside down, the whole system, because they essentially have to have our permission. If we convert all of our wealth and all of our labor and all of our money into Bitcoin, and it is indeed unconfiscatable, um, there has to be some, it goes back to the beginning of the U.S. government where there was some kind of moral contract where it was, we're going to perform these things and in exchange, you're going to agree to give us some of your tax dollars. Because before 19, I believe it was 13, same year they passed the Federal Reserve Act, they also passed federal income tax. Prior to that, it was all excise taxes, meaning either you used something that gave them permission to tax or they asked you literally, we want to do this thing, raise a Navy, raise an army, build some roads, do this particular thing. Will you please, as taxpayers, give us the money? And so if that is true, and I personally think that is probably right, then how does that help us stop this endless series of wars that many of the veterans who are part of Bitcoin veterans and anybody who's been in the military for any period of time knows exactly what the hell I'm talking about. We've been at war essentially for the last 50 years nonstop. And there's a constant turnaround of funding for the military industrial complex where we're spending hundreds of billions, if not trillions of taxpayer dollars. Maybe it's not taxpayer dollars. <laughs> Maybe they're just printing it. Either way, how does that potentially address these situations? Ooh, there's a lot there. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to kind of echo something you said there. I've never heard it framed that way, but I think it's a great framing for Bitcoin. Is that it is a permissionless money that makes governments ask your permission for your money. All right, it's permissionless in the system that anyone can participate, no one can regulate or change. Uh, and I want to be specific there. Obviously, you can regulate Bitcoin, you can pass laws about Bitcoin and what uh, people are allowed to do with it, what have you, but you can't regulate the system of Bitcoin, right? You can't pass a law that says there will be 22 million Bitcoin instead of 21, for instance, right? It's the actual core operating 
components of the system are regulated by the constituents of the system, which are nodes and miners and nodes select the rules, miners enforce the rules. So it's permissionless in that sense, but it's taking us back to that world you just described where governments actually need to ask your permission for your money or your purchasing power so they can go do stuff, right? Rather than a world in which they literally, and again, you said maybe it's not taxpayer dollars, maybe they're just printing it. Well, that's still coming from the taxpayer, right? It's still taxpayer purchasing power. And that's why, yeah. again, one of the key things about learning money, as we talked about with savings earlier, right? People think, oh, savings is money in the bank. It's like, no, 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 no. There's one, there's always a level deeper with money. And that's why it's such an interesting question. When you're printing money, you might be like, oh, well, we didn't steal it from anyone. We just printed it, right? We just printed it. It's no one's money. We just made it. And now it's our money and we're going to spend it. But the theft is the fact that there's a legally enforced currency counterfeiting monopoly that no one else, if everyone could just print money, well, then that money would fail, obviously. And people would choose a money that no one could print. That's why we got gold, by the way, right? Gold was the, the commodity that sufficiently exhibited the necessary properties of money, but it had the least flexible supply. So it was the most difficult thing to quote unquote print. And that's why people chose to save purchasing power in gold because it was insulated from the counterparty risk of others. People couldn't just arbitrarily print it. So, I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of drive, you know, just echo that point back to you. And then you also said that we've been at war for 50 years, basically nonstop. I mean, you know, the immediate quote that comes to mind is Ron Paul's quote, right? There, it's no coincidence that the century of total war and the century of central banking are the same century, All right? Once you go off of the gold standard and people are no longer able to redeem those dollars for gold, something that no one can print, well, then you have removed the mechanism by which people can call the dollars bluff, right? If you over issue dollars and there's too many in circulation and there's not enough the government or the central bank's not holding enough gold to justify those dollars in circulation, which is to say they don't have enough assets on their balance sheet to satisfy all of their outstanding liabilities, which is to say they are insolvent, right? If you lose confidence in the solvency of that organization, then you would go and redeem your dollars for gold. You would exchange, you would retire the liability that they owe you and you would redeem an asset off of their balance sheet. This is what kept governments in check basically and let people um effectively vote with their feet slash vote with their wallet right you could you could literally move your gold from one regime into another regime if they're being too irresponsible with, with the money printing but 50 years ago well that option was broken right in the 1971 yeah. nixon shock and so is it any coincidence that we've been in war nonstop for 50 years in the same period that governments have been able to print money ad infinitum with no one able to call that bluff on their solvency. No one yeah. able to say, you know what? I don't think you've got it. Show me what you got. Like yep. you can do that by force of law. Right. And you can't yep. enter the money printing business by force of law. So we have institutionalized violence pointed at individuals saying, you don't get to play this game. Only people inside, only the shareholders inside of the central bank do, and you don't. That's a two-tiered economic system. Yeah. In Africa, they call it apartheid, right? This is an unfair game. You, what game? Name a game that has a two-tiered rule system that we would call a fair <clears> game. <throat> what, what does that mean? What does that even mean? Like if we go to play basketball, I'm like, well, my shots count as they're all three pointers and yours are all twos. Like, is that a fair, like, what the fuck? No, no matter what you do, you no get to play that game. And then to make it worse, like say you're still smoking the guy, right? And you're just nasty and you're, he, all his shots are threes. All your shots are twos. You're still smoking them. Well, they, the guy has the power to change the rules. In real time, like any time you freaking want. To print more money. They have the power to change the rules and enforce it by rule of law. The power oh, to change the rules is the power to win in perpetuity. And if you're playing against someone who has the power to change the rules, then you're going to lose in perpetuity. And that's what fiat currency is in a nutshell. It's like you can't win that game. 
And this is why I say, when it comes to money, if you don't understand the game that's being played, then you are the game being played. Hmm. And so I don't know if that answered your question completely, but I just, those are the things that came up for me. And like, there is no answer to endless government overgrowth and endless government warfare other than fixing the money. There's literally, <laughs> what did Rothschild say? Give me the, issue, the power to issue a nation's currency. I care not who makes its laws. As Jeff Booth says, money is superordinate to law, right? It doesn't, law doesn't matter. Law can be changed through money. <laughs> so if you have, the legal monopoly on currency production and you have sold this psychological operation to a population, then you can do anything you want to them up to and including convincing them that forcibly injecting experimental genes <laughs> into their body is good for them. Oof. And so we have to decorrupt the money. You have to get the corruption out of the money. Otherwise, I don't know. I think, I think it goes deep, you know, obviously, I think it comes out a lot in the show, but it's all I, t I view it to be almost like a metaphysical corruption, like a corruption of the human soul itself. And um, I don't know. Thank God for Bitcoin. And if you don't, if you don't fix the money, you're doomed to continue to repeat the cycle until you do. Exactly. Yeah. It, you know, it's maybe a simple way to say that. And I think this is one as disagreeable as Bitcoiners are. I think there's one point of pretty strong agreement. And that is that incentives really matter a lot. And you could almost reduce humans to just incentive responsive creatures. Yeah. Yep. And it's so, almost, it's almost everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you have very broken incentives or you have, you know, again, a system in which one group of people can literally change the rules of the game, which is the power to win forever, but it comes at the cost of having a schism in society, right? You have people inside the central bank legal monopoly and you have all of the victims outside. That's the price of that power. That yeah. is, that's terrible, right? That's, that's, that's we're, we'll never, we will never develop a sustainable human civilization under that model. Never. Because you have predator prey dynamics between human beings. And so wh what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is just a level playing field. Right. It, we all we all are actually equal in the eyes of Bitcoin. It's a long held ideal of Western civilization. Equality in the eyes of the law. Right. The law. You've seen the statue. Justice is blind. She holds the scale in her hand. Right. And she holds a sword in the other. But she's blind because she doesn't see you. Doesn't matter who you are. Justice treats you all the same. That does not exist in a world with central banking. Right. Mm -hmm. Justice doesn't exist, frankly, but Bitcoin actually is blind. Bitcoin is actually blind and is therefore it treats all of us justly and impartially um, in the system that matters more than law itself, which is the system of money. Robert, we've uh, you, you've talked a lot about like um, studying Eastern philosophies and studying Western philosophies and like reading Mises. We, we have a very prodigious like book reading club is really what like a lot of Bitcoin veterans has turned into somehow. We've got some guys that like just will crush some books. Um, I'm curious and I think a lot of people listening are curious as to what maybe genres and specifically books that you're reading currently or recently that really has gripped you. Oh, man, I love reading um this has been a, i think the greatest gift bitcoin has given me personally is just <laughs> i've always loved to nerd out i've always been very curious my mom you know instilled this like appreciation for reading in me really young and bitcoin has just like thrown gas on that fire and it's become obviously a profession for me too so like i get to do this for a living now which is even more amazing so it's i'm so glad you asked that question um Early on in life, pre-Bitcoin, when I first started reading, it was astrophysics because I was try I was just fascinated by the stars and I wanted to figure out what all that was. Um, I read a lot of that. I think that really persuaded me to become pretty rational atheistic in a way. Like my views on the world were uh, very irreligious. I thought religion was, you know, fairy tale for adults. Um, then... I really started to focus on business and economics 
in late teen, early 20s. And then I started doing yoga in my early 20s and then started to get very serious into Eastern philosophy. So this is all pre-Bitcoin. Again, I didn't really just, let's see, how old was I? Like 30, I guess, when I really started to get into Bitcoin. So it was like early 20s. Um, and so, you know, Sun Tzu, Musashi, uh, I think I was very influenced by Taoism, actually. There's a saying in Taoism that the Tao, which we call the Tao, is not the Tao. It's like talking about the limitations of language, which is something we really go into on the show a lot. I didn't know starting the podcast, what is money, we'd end up just talking about language all the time. We're talking about etymology. We're talking about how, you know, what do words mean? There's always this kind of this problem of demarcation between the meaning of words. And um, a lot of argumentation seems to be centered on people not understanding, having the same understanding of what a word means. So anyways, yeah, Eastern philosophy. And then uh, more recently, post Bitcoin, I've been getting very into Neoplatonism, Neoplatonic philosophy. So, all right, on Neoplatonism, I'll throw out one book right now. Um, I'm going to throw out two books, actually. The second one's not so much Neoplatonism, but I love the author. Author is D.C. Schindler. This book was recommended to me by John Verveke as one of his favorite books. And it is, I didn't know anything about, I hadn't read much about Plato, Socrates, anything before this book. The book's title is Plato's Critique of Impure Reason. Again, the author is D.C. Schindler. Phenomenal book. Could not put it down. Just devoured it. Um, it will teach you how... Someone said... There was some philosopher that said all of Western philosophy is just footnotes to Plato. <laughs> and this book will give you a sense of that. Like Plato... And Neoplatonism more broadly, there's obviously Plato had his predecessors and his influence, people that influenced him. And there's many people that have been influenced by him. Um, and Socrates is the the archetype in Plato, right? He's, he's using Socrates as like the archetypal philosopher. And it's an excellent book. Another book by D.C. Schindler. This is not so much in the Neoplatonism category, but it was excellent. The Perfection of Freedom. Uh, these are very hard. That one's actually very difficult. I would say start with Plato's Critique of Impure Reason. Perfection of Freedom is a difficult book, but I found myself highlighting probably half the damn book. It was so good. I, DC Schindler just responded to my email today, actually, and agreed to come on the show. So I'll have him oh, on the show. That's cool. Uh, I'm going to throw out another book because it's sitting right next to me. But this one was actually recommended by Mike Hill, who was on the show. Uh, we did a long series together. He also recommended the book Leela by Robert Persig which is this, the sequel to Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Percy. We have, a, we have a whole series on that show, on that book, on the show. You can check that out called the Mike Hill series. Uh, I, I highly recommend that book as well, but I won't talk about it now because we have a whole series on it. But Mike recommended this book to me, Metaphors We Live By, and also by that author... Is it the same? No. So one, this is a co-authored book, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. And there's another book by George Lakoff. This one's much harder and longer. Uh, he's co-authored with Rafael Nunez, Where Mathematics Comes From. Um, I'm writing a piece about this now, but metaphor is very serious. Like, I think... All of our words and phrases are metaphorical. And, you know, oh man, if you, what's a good way to talk about this? Container metaphors. I'm going to run in the race. What does that mean? It means I'm going to participate in the race. There's not a, there's no race that's like a bucket that I'm going to get inside, right? That's a container metaphor. And when I, I say that, and it, it, it allows, what metaphor does is it allows you to interpret one type of experience in terms of another type of experience. And so I think we're constantly translating between our physical experience of the world, and then we create, meta, we metaphorize different aspects of that experience into thought. So 
uh, another example, and this is not just word. This is like it's how we form concepts. So we're 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 mediating between our perceptions and our conceptions, right? Our actions and our ideas through metaphor as like the mediating tool. So a, a, an example of a conceptual metaphor is argument is war, right? Uh, she attacked all my weak points, right? Um, he's dominating this debate. Um, you know, we, we say these things, like no one's attacking, like you, you argue, no one's actually attacking anyone. No one's actually dominating anyone. Um, you know, oh, you're losing ground. You know, we say things like this when we're talking about argumentation, but that's not, people aren't losing it. There's no ground being won or lost, right? This is all an abstraction. We're talking about ideas and, and reasoning and argumentation. Yep. But that influences how we actually enact arguments. So it's like we we actually win and lose arguments, right? We actually, so anyways, um, I think you'll, when you start, and you can also check out John Verveke's The Meaning Crisis, where he talks a little bit about this. And at the end, he's like, he's saying, do you understand what I'm saying? The word understand, by the way, is metaphorical. It means to stand beneath, to get a deeper perspective on something. The ancient Greeks called this hypostasis. He says, do you get my point, right? A point, obviously, is a tactile metaphor, right? Two things converging together. Um, do you see what I am saying? Well, you don't see what people are saying. You hear what they're saying. So why do you say see, right? It's like we, we, in the same way that we live totally immersed in money, and maybe that's why it's so hard to talk about because we're so, it's literally the, the water in which we swim. And it's a water from which we never break the surface. Like we've never lived in a world without money. Like most of us, maybe none of us, I would assume, right? Most people that live in society have never lived in a world without money. I think we live cognitively and experientially fully immersed in metaphor. Like mm. it is so pervasive. Yeah. So anyways, <clears throat> I don't mean to go on and on about it, but that book has really changed how I look at the world. Um, and yeah, so those are some good ones. What is another good one? Um, man, I try, I usually read two at a time. What I'm reading right now is, uh shit let me look at the title it's a, it's a book on re relationality it's called relation as ontological ground but it's called uh oh here it is heidegger neoplatonism and the history of being and the subtitle is relation as ontological ground that's a very very good book and it's a then mouthful I'm, yeah it's a mouthful it's very difficult um but i'm i don't just love this stuff and i'm reading that in conjunction that's a physical book i'm reading that in conjunction with a kindle book called an ecological approach to visual perception which is a i don't know if i'd recommend that one it's very hard but um talks about how animals see things you know another one that i enjoyed recently that was recommended by i think this came from svetsky actually war speak that's six. <laughs> six books. <laughs> I might have one or two. I'll stop this one. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Nietzsche's <laughs> victory over nihilism. I don't think I yeah. agreed with everything in the book, but I didn't know a lot about Nietzsche. And, you know, it was Nietzsche where we got the term the sovereign individual. Actually. Yeah. And so All right. I'm going to I'm going to share one with you really quick, and then we're going to go to Gabe for a question, and then we're going to move to wrap up here pretty soon. Let's do it. So uh, part of Bitcoin veterans, sort of the culture, so you understand the culture. Like we're big believers in resilience. We're both big believers in embracing the suck, so to speak, doing hard things, being uncomfortable on purpose because that's where you grow. Um, we're big believers in respect and honor and restoring respect and honor among men. A great book that talks about this kind of stuff. I'm going to read a quick quote and I'll show you the book. So the quote is, a man who is more concerned with being a good man than being good at being a man makes a very well-behaved slave. Mm. And that's a quote by Jack Donovan and the book is the way it meant. So this is something that we recommend all of our guys read. 
I think the you would enjoy men. that. The way of men. Okay. Donovan, you said? Yeah. Okay. I'll order it right now. He has a, it's, a, it's actually like, he's got two follow on books too from that, that, you know, it, first off, just like way of men. Great, great book. But then if you want to dive deeper down that rabbit hole, he's got uh becoming a more perfect beast and third one way of the uh, barbarian or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah. The way of the barbarian. Uh, awesome. Like tapping, talk about like, like tapping into what you are at your core and understanding that, Mm. instead of just you know civilized society makes us want to we're we're almost like domesticated and we're trying to ignore what we really are mm. on the inside which you know we can be smarter and more well-rounded but don't forget like your if you if you deny your capability that you have down in you then you're you're living a lie yes i agree with that wholeheartedly that another thing about today like to get in touch with that ancient masculinity i mean i don't know what it is about shooting guns so i mean we just like to play with physics i think as men like if it's we've been playing with missiles right and fire and vehicles like all of these things that we like it's something about playing with physics mm -hmm. and tools it's not it's just that it's it's fun. it's the projection of force in a very precise way with the purpose of um basically enforcing your will upon the environment full stop mm -hmm. you like, know what, I'm... what we do in the military is we 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 enforce policy but we do it kinetically with a very precise objective and by doing that that's basic that's the basis of freedom all free men there's a saying that free men do not ask permission to bear arms you know in switzerland even today there is a canton where the men when they show up to vote they show up with swords on their back hmm. real swords not joking because it's a symbol of their sovereignty. They are free men. So it goes hand in hand. I think it's inseparable. Well, perfect, uh, perfect segue into my question. Um, thank you for that. Um, so we know that there, there's a transference of power, of energy it, that is used um, in, in, the, in what is the eventual result of Bitcoin ending up in the hands uh, of those that are holding it. And so when we when we possess it, we, we literally possess power. Um, and Jason Lowry talks about this this power in in uh, his thesis, Soft War. And he even um, suggests that uh, that Bitcoin should be protected under the Second Amendment. What are your thoughts, first of all, on his work and on and on that uh, on that suggestion? Well, I think Jason is brilliant. Uh, he's also been on the show for a long series. I've read a lot of the end of his book. Uh, I didn't read the beginning because I think I got sort of the setup from our conversations, and then I read the real meat of it towards the end. So I, I can't speak to his entire book. Um, but I would like to read the whole thing. He's, he's, the book's great. He, I was really impressed. Um, so again, the word, and there seems to be a lot of ambiguity on the word power, right? People don't like this. A lot of people gave him pushback, right? When he described Bitcoin as digital power, for instance. Um, however, Power is often conceived of as purely a political quality, right? The idea of having authority over someone else or being able to tell someone else what to do or, you know, I don't know, being able to, being higher in the hierarchy than someone else, right? You're more powerful, more influential, whatever it may be. But they're all, that's all in the sphere of, you know, human action and politics. There's also this distinctive, a moral physical dimension to power right just the physics definition of power which is i think what he's talking about mostly is obviously they're related right it's energy per unit time right so how much energy can you project per unit time that's that's power per physics now the more power you can project per unit time that as you just described alex right you are in posing your will or policy 
kinetically, well, that gives you political power, right? Like this nation was founded in a rebellion, a kinetic rebellion against England to declare its sovereignty as the United States. Um, so they're, they're related, but they're not the same, right? It's not okay to just say power and then people think, oh, well, it's just political and just arbitrary and imaginary and what it's like no there's also this physical dimension and they're interrelated and really the political depends on the physical so but there's another and this is a weird one too right this is again where money trips me up because the the main feature of money is that it is an instrument for transmitting purchasing power across time and across space, right? But what in the hell is purchasing power, right? Purchasing power, it's almost like the the inverse, it is the inverse of a price, basically, right? Price is uh, how many dollars does this good cost? And purchasing power would be the reverse. How many goods does this dollar cost, basically? So how many goods is the dollar worth versus how many dollars is the good worth? Purchasing power is a strange one, right? Because it's something that we arrive at consensually, right? You can't really force someone to want to buy something, right? You might be able to force them to keep it or you could forcibly take something from them. In terms of forcibly manipulating the market price or people's preferences for certain market goods, that's much more difficult to accomplish. So... And I guess this kind of gets back to the idea earlier of when we said Bitcoin is like an, a real instantiation instantiation of that ancient ideal of power to the people. I think purchasing power, and this maybe is why Rothschild said that quote, right? Give me the power to issue a nation's currency and I care not who makes its laws. And as we said earlier, for Jeff Booth, money is superordinate to law. We're saying purchasing power is superordinate to political power maybe superordinate to physical power as well if physical power can't be used to confiscate that purchasing power it can render political or physical power impotent not doesn't mean you can't be killed bitcoin's not a force field it doesn't make you invincible but if all of a sudden me killing you doesn't pay me because I can't get your purchasing power, which is not the case if you have a chest full of gold, right? I just kill you and take your purchasing power. So my physical power turned into purchasing power. If we change that relationship between physical power and its ability to acquire purchasing power, then maybe we change all of our structures of political power. Yeah. That's how I see it. And so the question about the Second Amendment, like I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a constitutional. <clears throat> I, I, I love, I appreciate the constitution. I'm born in America. I think it's probably one of the greatest implementations of human freedom we ever have ever created, especially in a decentralized Republic constitutional Republic, as we were originally founded, not a democracy. I believe in all of that. However, I ultimately think that because it's just scribbles on a piece of paper, it's not good enough, right? You need, incentives backing that and we've done our best to create them and we've done a pretty good job but uh, I've, I've said this somewhat tongue-in-cheek before but i also kind of mean it i think bitcoin is more american than the u.s constitution like it, in in the sense of spirit and ethos of preserving life liberty and property and holding the sovereignty of the individual above the sovereignty of the state i think bitcoin is more enabling of that ethos than the U S constitution. Yeah. And that may sound extremely radical, but I, I don't know. That's, that's my view. And so should you ask me, should Bitcoin be protected? <laughs> the Second amendment. I'm going to withhold my opinion about that because I don't know the implications, frankly, like a lot of people I've heard say, Oh, well, if you do that, then it's a weapon and they're going to classify it as munitions. And blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. What I'm here to tell you is that this mm -hmm. thing is more American in spirit than the whole constitution. As that's I fair. Yes. Even okay, bigger. so yeah. here's a thought in 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 line, sort of what with with Jeff Booth talks about money is superordinate to to law, which I agree with. Um, 
law is superordinate to government because government comes from law. Mm -hmm. You can't have government mm -hmm. without a set of laws, right? That's how it all starts. Mm -hmm. um, money is also superordinate to power because uh, power is basically control of your environment. And anybody who's in the military knows that what we do when necessary is we extend political power via kinetic spectrum to influence the environment. Every aircraft carrier that the United States has, every carrier battle group costs money. All the training of the sailors and the airmen who are flying those planes costs money. The Pentagon budget of almost a trillion dollars a year costs money. I would argue that the most powerful military on the surface of the planet costs money. And if you had a budget of a trillion dollars a year, you could pretty much exert whatever force on whatever nation in the world you wanted to. You could bomb any nation probably into the Stone Age. So money absolutely is superordinate to all of those other things. Law, government, and power. Oh my gosh. What time is it? I think it's story time. <laughs> okay, Robert. <laughs> this is how we end the show. <laughs> okay. We, we get it, Jordan. <laughs> what? Let's, let's explain to you what story, explain the producer. What story time is. So story time. Story time is basically where um Robert, as the guest, you get to tell a story that you like, that you think is funny or interesting or impactful on your life. Um just something that you thought was important to you. Like some of the stories we've done in the past, like the military guys have a very dark sense of humor. So we like to share stuff that probably really fucking sucked at the time, but in hindsight is real, you know, it's funny afterwards. So, uh, you know, just something that was maybe super challenging for you, um, or something super impactful for you, something that, it, it, that impacted the way you look at business, the way you run your life. Uh, Whatever it is, like, what do you think is uh, important to you, impactful, or maybe funny, something challenging that you dealt with in your life? Oh, man, well, you asked me that question, and it's like when someone asks me to tell them a joke, and I immediately freeze. I'm like, shit, I don't have a joke. Okay, no, no joke. Either A, tell us what was one of the most impactful things that ever happened to you, or B, something that sucked really bad. So... The thing that comes to mind, and it's not funny, so sorry, guys. No, I don't think Maybe I'll tell a joke at the end. We'll laugh at you anyway. I'll tell you a dad joke real quick. Um, did you guys hear about the fire at the campground? It was intense. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> my dad joke. <laughs> nice. Um, dad joke for the win. And th this, is why, this is why Robert's a philosopher, poet, <laughs> instead of a comedian. Uh, so the thing that came up for me as you were asking that question you were asking about like something that was intense or transformative and maybe how lessons from business sort of I think there's a lot of wisdom actually like is, I, one of my favorite things about Bitcoiners is that they're basically all entrepreneurial I don't think I've met a non-entrepreneurial Bitcoiner even if they work a 9 to 5 they have some kind of side hustle thing, whatever hobby they're working on. They're all super smart, all super interesting, like all ethical hustling. Like I it's just, I really appreciate the, the characterization of a Bitcoiner. And um, I think there is tremendous wisdom to be gained from just like, you know, even though these guys like Charlie Munger, right? God rest his soul anti-bitcoiner said a lot of stupid shit about bitcoin i don't care i read munger's book about wisdom that guy's fucking full of wisdom right he has made billions of dollars implementing simple heuristics and basically not opening himself up to catastrophic errors and it's just little things um and i think there's a lot to be learned about life from dealing with people in a commercial setting or commercial settings right running your own business um you know even when you're an employee right your your boss like if you ever had employees you want your employee to think like an owner right you'll literally say that yeah. right? you should take ownership of this even in a non-business setting if you've done something wrong inside of your household if your child spilt the milk or whatever 
and they try to deny it, you're like, no, just take ownership, like own the situation, be responsible. You know, so this idea of ownership, which is obviously very intrinsically related to business, um, it, it seems like it's very tightly bound to responsibility. And I don't think there, you can, you can never take on too much responsibility, right? Like even if you're taking on the responsibility for others on behalf of others, like that, that there's never a limit to that. It was like, you know what, you've done enough, like take on some less responsibility. We always need more, right? So anyways, just to set all of this up, when I going through, you know, March 12th, 2020 was the beginning of the pandemic for me. That's when the national or I guess international emergency was declared, right? And they started shutting things down. And I had a young daughter at the time. She was a year and a half old. Uh, I was pretty into the Bitcoin rabbit hole at that point. So it's not like it was a surprise to see the state do some weird shit all of a sudden. It's not like I was caught off guard, but to see how fast it happened. And I was living in Los yeah. Angeles at the time and we were seeing rioting in the streets and, you know, we're in a very, like a nice place. I thought like in a nice part of town in Los Angeles. And all of a sudden they're like, you know, police taping off my daughter's park that she would play on every day. And everyone's like, it's like someone, the government flipped a switch and half the population's mind. And everyone's like, I need to get this thing and wear a mask and stay six. Like my tennis, inner Tennessee boy just started to be like, holy shit, I am surrounded by psycho humans. Like I have to, I have to leave. I have to get back to where people know that taxation is theft and gun ownership is okay. And you don't have to do everything you're told. Like it just, it was this sudden crisis of character or, or really more of an existential crisis. I was just like, what the hell? And I lit, I, we moved, I moved away from California shortly thereafter, but Going through all of that, at first I didn't know what was going on like everyone else, right? I'm like, oh my God, is this going to be like the zombie apocalypse and this disease is going to kill hundreds of millions of people and we're going to be fighting over food and what, like what, where does this go? Again, I'm like dad of a young daughter mode, right? Overly protective, like, like, and so leave Los Angeles, road trip to see some family, like thinking through what to do about all this, you're seeing the propaganda about the jab, right? You start seeing the scientific evidence and the reports and, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at it. I'm always skeptical and asking questions, but what I saw from just a purely business standpoint was someone that had created government had created a product and they were now trying to give this product away for free, which didn't seem to work well. Like there was a lot of resistance to that. So then they started creating incentives to give away this product for free, giving people the donut, the happy meal. Uh, then there was like the, advertisements on children in children's cartoons like children's cartoon characters advertising this product to children and their and i in that like in seeing that that i didn't need to read any research i didn't need to know anything about mrna i didn't need to know any bio medical anything i didn't have to open a single textbook or read a single page about biology vaccines, his nothing. All I needed to know was one simple line of business wisdom to know that whatever was in that product, it was not going in my body or anyone's body in my family. And that was the saying that if the product is free, then you are the product. And it echoes the line I said earlier, where if you don't understand the game being played, then you are the game being played. And if you didn't understand the game being played in that situation, I think with hindsight, most people that are intellectually honest would look back and say they got played, right? It didn't do what it was supposed to do. And it seems to come, have come with a lot of harmful side effects. So that's the story that came up for me. And again, you just you dispense with so much argument and analysis and back and forth and politics and what you should do and the... It's just very basic, pragmatic business wisdom that you can put in one sentence. 
and you can apply this to anything. All right. It's also true of social media, by the way, right? You may have noticed your Facebook account is free. Well, guess what? Because you're the mm -hmm. product. They sell your attention to advertisers. You're not the user, you're the product. So that was, um, yeah, that's how I saw it. And I think it was an accurate assessment of reality. So I am grateful to the wisdom of business and whoever said that. I don't know who said that originally, but I heard it at some point and it, I think, um, was a real good thing in my life and my daughter's life. So I'm grateful for that. Right on. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right. This has been an absolutely fantastic conversation, Robert. I feel like we could absolutely talk for hours. No doubt about it. Uh, I've enjoyed this greatly. Uh, why don't we go around and get some closing comments from Mike, Jordan, and Gabe. Robert, we'll make you, we'll let you make you, we'll let you make whatever closing comments you want and then I'll wrap it up. I got, I got no real closing comments other than just thanks for coming on, Robert. Like I appreciate you bringing the, the explicitly philosophical angle, um, and like discussing like the communication protocol and everything as, like, as you, as you know, like, cause I've chatted with you and then like all the other guys here and like all of our viewers is like, I appreciate talking about the things that are tangentially related around the whole Bitcoin topic, like talking strictly Bitcoin and only Bitcoin can get old and repetitive. So I appreciate you bringing that to the show. Likewise. Thank you. Yeah. Same here, man. That's a, that's a, a whole different level right there that we just went to. And, 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 and I was familiar with the statement of, you know, if, you know, if there isn't a product, then you are the product, but the whole, you know, turning it around to, you know, if you don't understand the game, then you are the game. I think that that's a message that really does resonate a lot with, with veterans, um, having been within the system and having, you know, been the product inside of, of that, of that war machine. And, um, in the fact is, I mean, a lot of us are pissed off about it and that's why we're here. Uh, so I, so I appreciate you, uh, you voicing, voicing that message in that tone and sharing that with us. So, um, and also thanks for the book recommendations. You've given me some more stuff to some, some more of investments to put in. Um, and I also heard somewhere that it's not hoarding if it's books. So I'm just going to keep on <laughs> stacking them up around the house, man, because they just keep on coming in through the door. But, but, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. It's been You're awesome. Quite welcome. Yeah. I just. To echo everybody else, I really appreciated this conversation. I feel like we could have talked for three more hours and still only scratched the surface. And I think, you know, that's kind of something you touch on a lot in your conversations um, is how because it's kind of Bitcoin touches everything, you can kind of dive into everything. And I, I think we we went deep on a lot of things and still only scratched the surface. And that's just like, that's a really cool thing about you know bitcoin kind of it's like it's the thing that frees up your time mm. to allow you to go pursue your passions and read like i'm also i love to read like it has taught me how to better use my time because i value my time so much mm. and having the conversation about like a new renaissance and tapping into the like there's this dichotomy of like the past and the future globalization versus localism where like we can kind of use both, but don't forget about one of them just because it seems old or outdated or nefarious or something like there is some, there's a lot of yin and yang. I feel like we talked about today. It was just, it was an awesome conversation. I wish we could talk for three more hours. Well, thank you so much. No, I really enjoyed it as well, guys. And um, I have to thank you for the fellowship frankly like it's it's bitcoin has given me so much in life it's almost overwhelming um the people i've met and you know friends i consider you guys to be friends so thank all of you for this and um you know uh closing words i guess just um what's that old saying the, you might not be interested in war but war is interested in you right well <laughs> It's true for Bitcoin too, man. Bitcoin need you know doesn't need anyone, but everyone that comes into Bitcoin and really studies it closely, I just see them transforming positively. Yeah, and then they start. Then it echoes out, right? Like that, and then in all of their relations, they start to benefit those around them 
even if it's just at the margin, right? They become, they have a little bit more freedom because of Bitcoin's purchasing power going up or they're, they've decided to improve one aspect of their life. So they're setting a good example for someone else in their life. So just um, I study Bitcoin, you know, it's, just, it's really that simple. Just study it and see what happens. Like you have nothing to lose. You literally have nothing to lose. And there's so Amen. many good resources out there. So many good people um, that are very strong in the educational front. Everyone resonates with someone differently. And um, I, I think that is probably the best advice I can give anyone at this point in history. It's like something really big is is happening and you have a chance to learn about it through others before you have to learn about it <laughs> through pain. And the, the more tongue in cheek way to put this is you can take the orange pill voluntarily or you can take the orange suppository involuntarily. <laughs> it's, like, it's the money is going to fail, right? All fiat money has failed. What are you going to do? Just ask yourself, you know, what, if you wake up tomorrow and the money doesn't work, think through the consequences of that. What are you going to do to protect yourself and your family? Um, these are dark, I mean, not fun things to think about, but um, obviously failure to prepare is preparing to fail. So I think it's a worthwhile endeavor to study Bitcoin and um, and maybe it will bring you many gifts too, like it's brought me and many, many others. So that's what I, I hope people will uh, take to heart as a call to action. Yeah, yeah man. Hell yeah. Robert, thanks for being here. This has been a fantastic conversation. I think we need to do this again, man. There's so much more yeah, yeah. that we can talk about. So maybe someday down the road, uh, we will do that. Uh, so thanks for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Breelove, you have been listening to Bitcoin Veterans. We are signing off for the night. We will see you again next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Love you guys. Take care. Be safe. We're out.